thank you for joining us for a conversation around the Walkway Freedom Trail and America's River of Dreams. I'm Bill Jeffway. I'm the executive director of the Dutchess County Historical Society. I've been so for about five years and very pleased to be on the research committee of celebrating the African spirit, which in former days was the Dutchess County Black History Committee. And I serve on that committee and they've been very helpful in uh, helping assess how we interpret some of the findings we uh, evaluate from the past. So it's wonderful the two organizations I'm involved with are developing this permanent online trail uh, so that it can be self-guided from your desktop or sofa, or it can be taken on foot for, the, for the, those who are a little more ambitious. We also wanna thank Dutchess County government for sponsoring our virtual event space this month, which means sponsoring this program, which allows us to bring programs like this to the public at no cost. So we thank Dutchess County as well for their uh, support again this year. So I can't think of another space uh, where the dramatic tensions of the Civil War can be more readily and palpably felt than while walking across the walkway, uh, kind of uh, hanging high above the Hudson River. And I think one of the things we'll notice today is the great uh, power and duality of the river. And most know that it's not a river, it's an estuary and it changes direction a couple times a day. And this duality and cut and thrust and to and fro is kind of an underpinning to the stories that we're gonna look at. But in particular, I think we're all familiar with the stories of national leaders like Sojourner Truth, who's memorialized in a statue to the West by Vinnie Bagwell. And we're coming to learn more about Frederick Douglass and the speech he gave at College Hill in Poughkeepsie for Emancipation Day in August of 1858. But there are extraordinary stories of men, women, and even children who have at least the same amount of moral courage, I would argue, as these leaders. If a 10-year-old boy is kidnapped, illegally sold into slavery, and keeps his mind on freedom for 10 years so he can tell the story, that seems to be a pretty good, uh, pretty good claim to, um, to moral backbone and fiber. So getting to a closer historical truth is kind of the ambition here, a more inclusive truth. We used to say that the victors write the history and now I think collectively as a society, we wanna hear more than just the victor's story because that leaves out a lot of people. And that's what we're gonna to try to do uh, today. I think by doing so makes history and especially local history more valuable by listening to a greater diversity of voices and by including local voices, I think we end up with a more valuable history. So I thank my partners at Celebrating the African Spirit and the Historical Society that support me in these kind of efforts. I'm effectively gonna take you through the trail uh, there's a section called Boats Against the Current, but I'll, I'll speak to it with this image. Boats, occurrence, boats, boats Against the Current is simply the idea that, um, especially over our alternating river, river here, that nothing's ever a straight path. And every step of this trail, you'll find stories of an advancement of liberty and stories of steps back and lost. It's a river of peace and opportunity, but of course it was center stage for the Revolutionary War. And it was a river of great opportunity in terms of the Underground Railroad, but it was a perpetual daily minute to minute risk for kidnapping and illegal enslavement. So we will constantly see these uh, contradictions. So we've heard leaders like Martin Luther King say, the uh, arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. And we know that it does, but that it doesn't do that alone. It does so by the words and deeds of a lot of people and hard work. So if we uh, just allow me to introduce you to uh, a few of the people with a little background on the water. The amazing thing about the Hudson River is that 
it's midway between the Atlantic Ocean and the Mohawk River. And we sometimes say we're, we're kind of between New York City and Albany. And that really understates the, the history and scope of what we're between. It's this area is between the cusp of the Atlantic Ocean and all the shipping routes east and around the world. And the Mohawk River, which was greatly amplified in importance by the Erie Canal, in 1827, and we've kind of had this pivotal route uh, and role. And it really is this waterway that became the backbone of the Empire State uh, economic and political power. The little blue in, these, in the second box there, I'm trying to indicate with the red dot of Poughkeepsie that Dutchess County largely settled around the Y-shaped uh, Wappinger Creek and Fishkill and Columbia County settled largely around the U-shape role of Jansen Hill. And that was a very, in very broad and general terms, a very general uh, border area between the, uh, the vast Mohican civilization to the north and the vast Delaware civilization uh, to the south. And those uh, underpinnings of water, I think one of the things we greatly un underestimate these days because it's all paved over so nicely, we don't even know we're driving over a creek or water is, we can forget how fundamental water is to where we've settled and how we have lived and worked and emerged. So the Dutch in the third panel there emerged with Fort Orange and New Amsterdam, focusing really on the, more on the two extremes. Uh, and the English come along and start to populate the points in between Albany and New York City in earnest in the, by the middle of the 18th century. So this is just a reminder of how central water is to where we end up settling and living, working, playing, and what we do. What we do. Um, there's an interesting uh, east-west dynamic that is unique to Dutchess County. And when I have visitors to Dutchess County, I always enjoy uh, showing them this dynamic because in the 19th century, Dutchess County had the largest Quaker population outside of Philadelphia, and the Quakers were radical abolitionists, forbidding their uh, members to own slaves by 1766. And they were radical about the role of women, saying that they were entitled to an equal education and an equal participation in society. And this is why so many of the women's suffragists and early women's movement had leaders that came from Dutchess County, including uh, Lucretia Coffinmott, who uh, was first a student and then a teacher at Nine Partners School in Melbourne. By contrast, we're looking at the left at the beautiful dining room of Montgomery Place and Janet Livingston, who, uh, who had at one point about a dozen uh, enslaved persons at Montgomery Place, and perhaps our most outspoken slavery advocate is the well-known author J.K. Paulding. He was born in Dutchess County and came as he became more famous and successful, came to settle uh, in Hyde Park on an estate there. He was an outspoken advocate for slavery, saying it was the natural condition and the natural state. So in a single town like Hyde Park, you might have uh, J.K. Paulding being a national voice for slavery, and what you see on the right is the Cromwell Meeting House uh, in, also in Hyde Park, where outspoken abolitionists uh, uh, like uh, some of the women uh, who were members there uh, were, were equally outspoken on the other side of the argument than Paulding. So this, I think, really is a unique dynamic to Dutchess County that we have this duality of extreme wealth and enslavement and these powerful abolitionist voices. I mentioned before, I think, you know, many of us saw 12 years a slave, but I think that, uh, that unfortunately that was far more common risk than we might uh, have been led to believe. So if we think of a person of color in the 1830s, although New York State would have abolished slavery in 1827 and technically be a free state, the river was always providing a risk. And as you'll see, even the roads and horses were providing a risk of kidnapping into the South. And one of the dualities that we'll look at and tensions ends up 
being the concept that was expressed by Abraham Lincoln when he talked about the fact that a house divided would not stand or cannot stand. And we'll look at that when we get to College Hill and hear Frederick Douglass talk about that. One of the reasons a house divided on slavery could not stand and would become either all slave or all free was this point right here, that there were channels and avenues for freedom and there were channels and avenues for kidnapping and illegal enslavement. And it was not working that states could be free and some could be slave and the world lived happily ever after. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, especially when we get to College Hill. Uh, you occasionally come across uh, uh, a Southern politician, I'm thinking of one in particular, named uh, Boulden, who said that enslaved persons were the happiest that they could be. And it struck me that almost virtually everyone you run into in this period is saying they don't want to be a slave. And uh, we all know uh, the uh, famous phrase, uh, give me liberty or give me death, but that was preceded by some other words that said, is life so dear? or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery. So certainly uh, there was a, de a desire by American patriots to describe the oppression by uh, King George III uh, as enslavement. And we find also at the same time, we go to Rhinebeck in 1793, very outspoken woman, Anne Shippen, married a Livingston and found him to be dreadful. And right after giving birth to their first child, declared that marriage to give delight must join two minds, not devote a slave to the will of an imperious Lord. And here is a woman saying, I don't want to be a slave to my husband in the way the Patriots don't want to be a slave to King George. And there's more. <laughs> One of the interesting dynamics that we don't often talk about as much is the arrival of Irish Catholic immigrants in the 1850s to work on the railroad. And they had a pretty tough time. And Frederick Douglass actually had to escape the United States uh, fearing his own life. And he went to Ireland and he became very friendly with Daniel O'Connell, uh, the revolutionary leader there. And Daniel O'Connell said about, and in this particular case, he was talking about the Irish on the uh, Emerald Isle itself, that you may soon have the alternative to live as slaves or die as freemen. In other words, standing up against the British Empire may not even be successful, but the only alternative is to be enslaved. So again, we have a group of people saying the last thing in the world they want to be is enslaved. At the same time, before the Civil War, there was a movement by white Protestant working class. It was called the Mechanics Political Movement, and Mechanics was a reference to uh, uh, shoemakers, blacksmiths, skilled tradesmen, but who were not making much money. And the political leader in Dutchess County of the Mechanics Movement declared that there were the, the uh, poverty that these white Protestant working class suffered uh, meant that they were over 7,000 landless slaves in Dutchess County. He felt there were 7,000 uh, poor white Protestants who did not have enough money to begin to have property to start to make their step up the ladder. So to the gentleman in Virginia who said that the slaves were as happy as they could be, I just ask why every, seemingly everyone else didn't want to be a slave and, and considered it a condition uh, that was um, intolerable. Okay. It's such a pleasure to start on the west end of the route with the memorial statue by uh, Vinnie Bagwell. What I particularly like about it is that it holds lessons uh, in, the, in the folds of the uh, garments so that we not only can imagine what Sojourner Truth looked like, we can 
reflect on the degree to which she had an impact over uh, many subsequent generations. So if we start there, and I was reminded, uh, reminded of a, um, reminded of the, um, the moment that she declared that she refused to dignify um, slavery by uh, running away and insisted and said that she would simply walk away. And this was a wonderful way of just quietly saying that she had confidence in herself and uh, would do the right thing. And I was talking to Carmen McGill about this poem because she's a fan of this poem. This is a little bit of a snippet of a Maya Angelou poem that says, a woman in harmony with her spirit is like a river flowing. She goes where she will without pretense and arrives at her destination, prepared to be herself and only herself. And I couldn't help but think that's a beautiful testimony to Sojourner Truth, who was 29 years old when she refashioned herself using the words that she felt God had intended for her in a role to be uh, walking in, uh, the world and telling people to uh, discover the truth. So that's a wonderful way of starting. And then in several instances, I want us to just consider stopping on the bridge and reflecting. The bridge itself, when you're above the river, is incredibly powerful because it does not feel like you are uh, over the river, it feels like that river is around you. As you start to walk over the bridge, the first person I ask you to think of is a young seven-year-old girl named Sophia Pooley, who in 1762, she had been, she was a, sl a slave of, uh, in Fishkill, just south of Poughkeepsie. And we know about her story because in 1852 through 1856, a gentleman took first person uh, uh, narratives of the uh, of freedom seekers. The, we talk about the runaways uh, heading to Canada, but we very often don't hear about their story once in Canada. So if we stop here to reflect below, uh, Sophia Pooley was living in Fishkill in Dutchess County, five miles south, and the sons-in-law of her owner, for whatever reason, on the brink of the Revolutionary War, sold Sophia into slavery in Canada. She actually was owned by the famous uh, indigenous leader, Chief Joseph Brandt. There's an inset image of him. So of course, this raises a lot of questions. Uh, we don't often think of indigenous peoples enslaving others, but that is something that uh, Canada is exploring uh, in the spirit of of truthfulness. This is a wonderful depiction of what Sophia Pooley might look like by an indigenous artist in Canada who allowed us to use her depiction of Sophia Pooley because essentially Sophia Pooley went to Canada at age seven among, and lived with indigenous people was effectively adopted into that culture. And um, if you go to the trail, you'll find links to her full story of what it was like to be in Canada to do that. She said, I guess I was the first colored girl to come to Canada. The white men sold us to Indian brand, the king. So if we pause and think below, uh, she used the words that it was, uh, it was so dark and she was so removed. She had no idea how long she was actually down there. And uh, uh, you, you can imagine the fear of a young girl being bound, gagged, and put in the hold of a ship. So there are darker stories like that that we can reflect on. The fact that we are uh, looking at the center stage of the Revolutionary War uh, is, you know, some, sometimes we talk about that in terms of um, the great history of our country, but it was a very perilous time. And the strategy by the British was to um, have uh, an approach from the north, from both the Mohawk River and then straight down from Canada, uh, while there'd be troops coming up from the south. And 
George Washington called this area the key to the North American continent because if Britain could have broken, successfully kind of penetrated that area, they would have broken New England from, the, um, uh, from New York and the other states. And you start to understand how important the east-west dynamic is uh, in, in this river valley as well, and how strategic this uh, particular portion is. One of the most dramatic moments would have been in October of 1777, if you were somehow at this point on the walkway uh, high above the Hudson in October of 1777, you would have seen British ships coming up with a view to burning Kingston, which they managed to do. And uh, there's a letter in our collection that's particularly telling for a couple of reasons, and it's written in June of 1777. It's written by Henry Livingston of Poughkeepsie. He's writing to his brother and he writes, starts out by saying your Negro just delivered uh, the bonds and tenants books and so on. And it's an amazing example of how intimate the relationship was with the white enslavers and the enslaved. Unlike the South where there was a large scale plantation and big separate quarters, enslaved persons in rural parts and in areas like Poughkeepsie, lived in attics and basements in terrible conditions, but under the same roof. And in a way, the rural parts of the county were more, much more diverse and integrated in a more intimate way uh, in the 18th century than they are now. Of course, the intimacy was not real. And the profound difference between being a human being with rights and being a a, a, a legally property couldn't be more profound. So I mean it only in the sense that there was a physical intimacy, and yet there was this huge distance in terms of legal uh, definition. So uh, Livingston writes, your New Year was just delivered this letter to me, and he goes on to talk about the fact he opines that the British would be foolish to think of coming up the river, and it would never happen, uh, things are peaceable, he says, as far as the English coming up the river, I'm under no apprehension. It would be, uh, it would be madness attempting, attempting it. And also in our collection, we have the beam of his house that was hit by a cannonball. He was completely wrong. So of course the British had a tactical victory by burning Kingston, but fortunately for us, not a strategic victory uh, with the failure of the uh, British to uh, 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 <laughs> come from the North. Um, River of Peace and Light. So this is a, an amazing story that uh, was brought to my attention by Rob Doyle, our board president, who has studied New Hamburg very well. There is a story of a man from New Hamburg named Abram Williams, uh, a black man. He would have been 12 when slavery was abolished. By 1850, he owned a home in the south of Poughkeepsie at New Hamburg worth $500. And he owned a house that was next to his two sons' house. And I mention it because that's extraordinary wealth. We remind ourselves that in New York State in 1821, the property requirement that, uh, uh, for white men to have a certain amount of property to vote was lifted, but it was left in place for black men the requirement was $250, and that was an aggressive number and prevented the vast majority of Black men from being able to vote. And yet here, Abram Williams has a significant property and with his sons. I don't know how he necessarily did it. And he's not even the most famous person of his family, his son, Clinton Williams, who became a sloop captain of the Little Martha, which is a, there's a model of it there. Uh, his son became even uh, more famous and well-known than he did. So you do have these stories too, where uh, there are stories of uh, advancement and success. Move along carefully. People, people often ask about the Underground Railroad in Poughkeepsie. And of course, by definition, the Underground Railroad uh, is hard to figure out because it's meant to be kept secret. There's kind of a more traditional stop 
that we're coming to understand. And if you're on the walkway, just looking north over the, uh, just east of the railroad tracks along what, would be, what is today Hoffman Street, there was a little house there that was run by uh, a man named Samuel Thompson. And I'll just read uh, his uh, obituary in 1854. At Poughkeepsie, Samuel Thompson, age 69, died. He was a man of humane feeling, firm, unflinching advocate of the rights of man, which were his favorite themes of conversation. He was among the first abolitionists of this country, and often did he speak with pleasant emotions of the number of fugitives that he had helped towards Canada by the Underground Railroad. His end was calm and peaceful. So Samuel Thompson seemed to have owned a house and operated a safe house here for many years. I find it interesting that it's so close to what was the whaling dock because many of those captains were Quakers who had relocated from Nantucket. And in studying the journey of a young Poughkeepsie man who chose to move to Australia in the 1840s, I noticed that his captain's name was Coffin. And uh, this black family had in the 1830s been living in the Quaker stronghold of Dover among uh, the Coffin family. So I couldn't help but think that the Quaker community concentrated around this uh, whaling dock may have had some influence. There actually is a, an amazing story written by Samuel Thompson that was published in a letter that gives you some idea of what it was like to be a freedom seeker. Because we often talk about the freedom seeker observed from the outside, we often don't uh, necessarily hear enough about what their own experience, terrible, terrifying experiences, including saying goodbye to loved ones and then taking the risk of trying to go such a long distance. This is written by Samuel Thompson, and it's particularly interesting because in 1842, he is arguing that Charles Tyler was a son of President John Tyler. Now, there were accusations the moment John Tyler became president that like Thomas Jefferson, he had children through and with uh, enslaved women, and he denied it. And for years, those denials have kind of stuck, but literally within the past two years, through DNA evidence and other evidence, there may be some suggestion that the oral histories and oral traditions of the Brown family in Virginia actually hold some water, and that President John Tyler may have actually been the father of many uh, uh, mixed race children uh, from such relationships. And it's just interesting that the Thompson House on Hoffman Drive uh, may well have been host one evening to the son of, of John Tyler. There is a wonderful description of the securitist route and it helps you understand the risks taken. Uh, this journey took from Baltimore to Poughkeepsie uh, almost four months through the dead of winter. So from December to April. And if you go to the trail, there is a link to the longer story and testimony of this person. And I mention him only because he was, he, he really very specifically mentions that he had his sights on Poughkeepsie. He ended up in Ulster County, but he had his sights on Poughkeepsie. It's amazing to me how he had to go, uh, he went by horse in the first section without the red dots, where the red dot start was by foot. You can see he had to avoid Baltimore, then go into uh, Pennsylvania, try to get to Philadelphia, and then on up. Uh, and that took uh, four months. There are other instances of uh, happier stories in Poughkeepsie in 1840 under the heading Noble Conduct. There's a, a story about a Poughkeepsie group of young girls who were playing outside somewhere in Poughkeepsie. And uh, a black boy ran in among them from the street. It doesn't suggest how old he might have been. But uh, he said that he was a runaway slave, begged to be concealed from his uh, pursuers. Uh, 
and the girls hid him. And then when the pursuers came, the girls misled them as to where he was, and they managed to help him escape. Uh, it's it's a it's a it's a a positive story. I, I assume there's some uh, truth to it. There's another interesting story. In 1847, Charles Van Loon was a Rev Baptist reverend. He was speaking at a conference, and he kind of in an offhanded way just related the story that there was a Mrs. Wharton of Texas uh, visiting Poughkeepsie, and that while she was there, uh, her quote-unquote slave girl managed to escape uh, and enjoy her freedom. And for those of you who know Al Rosenblatt and his study of the uh, Lemon trial and case, this was exactly uh, the point and uh, he has now written a book about that, which is coming out soon. So you can see there are these stories where in some way or the other escapes are being facilitated. That said, I think in addition to the kind of classic person of the white, uh, of a white person having a safe house, if you look at the transportation hub, so this is the view from the bridge of the foot of Main Street. This is the Exchange Hotel. And if you look at the notes that we have in our collections for the person creating the uh, census or directory for that view, you quickly see that it's populated with persons of color. Women are chambermaids, a young black men are boat waiters, they're cooks, their attendants, their porters, their uh, chauffeurs. And you begin to realize that there's a, there's a very big uh, population. We often talk about free black communities, which I'll touch on in a minute, being kind of distributed and out in rural areas. But there were very strong, there's a very strong uh, black community along the river and employed by the river and doing river uh, work. This is an amazing example. In Rhinebeck, there is in the so-called colored portion of the cemetery, uh, uh, parents have four children buried there, three of whom died at the same time. They were three young black waiters on the reindeer when it exploded, as they so often did uh, at that time. But this is just an example of how populated the river route was and the transportation route was at that time. There are also uh, some what you might call fringe communities. We wouldn't have known about Boystown if it weren't for the fact that there was a young girl named Mary Taylor who tried to take refuge there in, eight, in the 1830s. And she became a rather famous story because she settled there for a while and then took her own life. And it, it was discovered that uh, she was pregnant when she took her own life. And it raises a lot of interesting questions. It's described as a uh, poor Negro uh, area, low black rookeries, uh, no persons uh, within a mile. And yet somehow this woman knew of it as a refuge and was able to uh, live there as a refuge. And so this is what I mean about, you never get answers, you kind of get more questions <laughs> as you go along. But here really is on the, the fringe, they call it the suburb of Poughkeepsie, but Boys Town is clearly shown on the 1834 map of Poughkeepsie. Uh, it's kind of a, a landmark map. But it really is the rural uh, free black communities that we've associated more with the Underground Railroad. Uh, Freemanville was uh, kicked off by a Caesar Freeman who bought small amount of property. It didn't grow into a, a good deal, but uh, the classic house there is featured in the history of the county as a house built into the side of a hill for saving money on uh, materials and uh, being more secure. It happened to be a style of house we found in the New Guinea community as well. Baxter Town is better known because it has an AME Zion church. And the real area of new learning is in New Guinea and Hyde Park and Oak Street in Rhinebeck. And the new learning in New Guinea is that not only was there a community along farmland along Fredonia Lane, but there was a uh, community emerging 
with as early as 1814, when Peter Griffin bought the house that, and, and lot that is, you now see uh, today. And if you can imagine by 1814, this is still how many years before, uh, 13 years before slavery ends in New York, that his land actually became in the back a gathering area for freedom seekers who were living in tents and shanties and not very healthy environments. And the uh, population of New Guinea, we know, grew dramatically by a factor of five over a couple of decades. Perhaps the most interesting thing is we know from local historians who kept track that Robert St. John was a freedom seeker from Brazil, headed to Canada, who decided to stay at New Guinea, and Saul Garnett was from Virginia, headed to Canada, decided to stay at Hyde Park. And we begin to learn that these free black communities were connected to uh, these routes of safety and that some of them decided that they were safe enough they didn't have to go all the way to Canada. Robert St. John spent the rest of his life as did Saul Garnett in Hyde Park and we're continuing to learn more about them. But you can start to see that between the population of uh, persons of color employed in the transportation industry, on fringe areas like Boyce Town, and free black communities like this can add up to, uh, uh, to a better, some of an understanding of uh, how the Underground Railroad might have worked. This just shows how strategic Maryland was relative to Philadelphia and the Quakers. And we are finding in our research on Oak Street and Rhinebeck a lot of persons of color who have been born in Maryland. So anyway, as I say, more questions than answers. But this is uh, two stories about the constant risk. Those are kind of the stories of um, the Underground Railroad and escape. But I also had said that the, there's a duality to this and a constant risk. And uh, we don't exactly know where along the Poughkeepsie waterfront that a uh, young boy was kidnapped and sold illegally into slavery. But I've kind of selected, if you're on the walkway, the opportunity to look down at Upper Landing. Upper Landing, uh, I've chosen as a place to stop and reflect because it was among the busiest and earliest of landings. That's because it's where the fall kill flows into the Hudson. So it was the site of uh, early mills. And I'm suggesting this is an opportunity to reflect on the story of James Goman. His story was published in the Colored American on June of 1841. And he recalled the event of his kidnapping 10 years earlier. And it's written by J.C. Pennington, a very reliable uh, uh, teacher. And he, Pennington reports that in 1831, the 10-year-old Goman was living in Poughkeepsie with his uncle, Amos Goman, who was a tailor. There's some other interesting tailors like John Bolding and the Vermonts that formed the community. The young boy was enticed onto a boat with the promise of oranges and was kidnapped and sold into slavery in Kentucky to John Cutter. And so we don't, we don't know much more about that. Than, that, than it happened. And Upper Landing is a spot that celebrating the African spirit has identified as an important place of remembrance for the larger story of the enslavement of Africans and their descendants and the incredible success and spirit, if you will, that allowed them to overcome that indignity. So I call out Upper Landing as kind of a symbolic place where the fall kill hit reaches the Hudson, where there would have been enslaved stevedores, um, and at the waterfront, where there was a constant risk for persons of color, it seems in particular young boys. We know a little bit more of the story of this kidnapping, which took place a year later in 1832. Isaac Butler was actually a well-known carriage operator between the Poughkeepsie Hotels in Connecticut. And he asked, of a, he asked the father of a young black boy if the boy could help him take horses to Virginia. And uh, Butler, as I said, was a well-known stable and livery operator. He had his home and stables on Market Street, just opposite Cat Cannon Street. 
And Butler got permission to, uh, from the young boy's father to uh, have him help him with his horses. So Butler comes back without the boy, saying the boy ran away. So of course, this is deeply, deeply suspicious, but it's, it's, it's not sure what the family can do. The boy was very clever in, New, in Virginia, and he continued to declare that he was free. He actually managed to escape, which turned out to be fortuitous because he was captured and put in front of a judge. And while he was in front of that judge, he told the judge of people he knew in Poughkeepsie, the postmaster he knew by name, he knew of Judge Emmett, uh, who was a well-known judge uh, and progressive judge. So the Virginia justice writes to the postmaster of Poughkeepsie and writes to Judge Emmett, who both say this boy is free. Long story short, the boy, they managed to get the boy back home. And we've been able to find the court records where the people versus Isaac Butler, uh, he was charged and we can't find, we haven't yet found the, uh, the, the verdict. But if it weren't for the outspokenness uh, and smarts of this young boy, he may never have been able to escape slavery and return home. So there we have some unfortunate, uh, some un un unfortunate and difficult risks. We wrap up by looking a little bit at College Hill. Our time, we're good. Uh, College Hill is an amazing place, very underappreciated, I would argue. And when you're walking uh, east, looking east from the walkway, you cannot help but see it. It's named College Hill because a very prestigious preparatory school was put there and uh, Franklin Roosevelt's father attended. But it was really the uh, combination of the school and the view that made it a public attraction. And we have this great, this is from our collections too. We have a, a great a depiction of the construction of it. This is right in 1835 or so. And they specifically mention that they keep a grove untouched uh, uh, of original forest on the west side. And you can clearly see it there. And uh, College Hill, if you go up there, gives you a 360 degree view. And this painting, uh, courtesy of Robin Sue Doyle's collection, is called The Catskills from College Hill. And you go up there and you can completely feel Poughkeepsie uh, in the Hudson River Valley because of the 360 degree views and the incredible history of it. But the history that's relevant to us tonight is on the Western side of the Grove where Frederick Douglass spoke in August of 1858. In those days, they celebrated Emancipation Day related to Britain in August of 1834, since slavery was not abolished in the United States. And I want to, of all the words we could choose to look at of Frederick Douglass's four hour speech that day, I'm going to play, hopefully you'll be able to hear, a performance there celebrating the African spirit with research help from the Historical Society, uh, hosted the first Frederick Douglass Day two years ago. And we were fortunate enough to have Paul Oakley Stovall, Hamilton musical actor, reenact some of the words of Frederick Douglass's speech from 1858. And I'm going to play just a few of them that relate to the House Divided speech, because uh, that will allow us to kind of wrap up with a focus uh, on, that, on that challenge. Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will either become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate extinction, or the advocates of slavery will push it forward so that it shall become alike lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. That was well and wisely said, Mr. Lincoln. 
One system or the other must prevail. Liberty or slavery must become the law of the land. And men, communities, parties, churches, and public measures are ranged on one or the other side, favoring the ascendancy of one or the other. Do I look, do I look serious? serious? Do I see? I see. I love that song too because we often speak about the power of Frederick Douglass's words, and Paul Oakley Stovall liked to sing about the power of Frederick Douglass's looks, his fixed face. He said Douglass did not want to be in any way suggesting that having been a slave was anything enjoyable. And I think it's wonderful that Paul Oakley Stovall focused on Douglass's image when so many focus on his words, although we do love his words. So there were, uh, there was Frederick Douglass saying, yes, the uh, divided house can't stand. And again, that it, it was a radical notion that sounded, they were accused of being unpatriotic because this, there were, the idea was live and let live. That if the North wants to be free, let it be free. The South wants to be slave, let it be slave. How could anything be more reasonable than that? And that people who talked about a divided house and a, that, that some convulsion would have to happen and things would become all one way or the other. They were the unpatriotic people. They were the people that weren't uh, respecting the Constitution. And of course, we know how that turned out, but only after 2% of the US population died, that would be 7 million people today in the Civil War that lasted much longer than anyone thought it would. So, Again, I think the examples of the river being a river of both freedom and great risk are very powerful illustrations of why the divided house could not stand. We'll take a quick look in wrapping up. Who might have been in the audience that day on the west side of College Hill? And the Boland family is very famous because Jane Boland was the first black female judge in the United States in 1929 and her father, Gaius Boland, the first black graduate of Williams College and the first black lawyer in the county. But prior to that, their parents, and I would give the Parents of the Century Award to Abram Bowen and Anne. <laughs> uh, Abram Bowen was born in Dover Plains, a Quaker stronghold. And uh, he married a woman, Alice Ann Lawrence, who is said to have been uh, of African and indigenous heritage, and they raised 11 children. And at the time that Frederick Douglass spoke, they would have been a young couple with only uh, one or two children. The woman shown to the right as an adult would have been a child. Uh, so there would have been three Bolins uh, at that uh, Frederick Douglass speech. I am sure Uriah Boston was in the audience because Uriah Boston was constantly publishing in national press uh, about abolition. And he was a very successful barber. He became a landowner, which was essential. I like to think that's a picture of him on Garden Street. They say he was always very well dressed, but we entirely don't know. And that's more speculation just to <laughs> give us a possible image. But very reluctantly, Frederick Douglass eventually allowed Uriah Boston to publish very letters very critical of um, Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass had said that in his papers that persons of color needed to get beyond being barbers and these lowly jobs. And he wasn't saying in addition, or he was actually saying we need to leave that behind. And Uriah Boston made a very strong argument that there's dignity in this work. And there certainly was wealth and there were connections and a, a black leader of the Underground Railroad in Troy was a barber. 
and it clearly allowed them to have enough wealth to have property. And uh, I find it amazing that it was in 1963 that Martin Luther King took the side of Uriah Boston and, and gave his famous speech that, that there's about dignity in all work. So we can take some pleasure in knowing that our Poughkeepsie's uh, Uriah Boston was effectively saying the same thing as Martin Luther King, but he was saying it a century earlier and he stood up to Frederick Douglass and challenged him on it. So I would imagine that Uriah Boston was in the audience. John Boulding, the story of John Boulding is probably fairly well known. There's this a wonderful sanitized story of him. If you see that, uh, there's an image of him from an ad in the 1950s that shows the wonderful people of Poughkeepsie buying his freedom while he's at Pine Street. And you know, in principle, that's true. And that is a wonderful part of the story. Um, we're also showing there the uh, Black History Committees, of, which has now evolved into celebrating the African spirit, their recognition of John Bolding, who's buried at the Poughkeepsie Rural Cemetery. And the community did come together and buy his freedom, but he was kidnapped uh, very in very sharp timing, uh, kidnapped while at work, put into a carriage with windows closed, and uh, uh, brought to the train station just as the train was arriving so he could be whisked away. He ended up, he was in a jail in the South uh, for months uh, in no glamorous setting. He was not at home. So while we can concur that the community did come together and buy his slavery, he, he had to go through a lot of suffering first uh, and uh, he had to be uh, brought back from the South. I was surprised to have only recently learned that John Bolding said he was the child of James Wood Bolding and an enslaved woman of Bolding's household. Bolding was a Congressman from Virginia and guess, guess what? He's married to a woman who was the niece of President John Tyler. The Tylers keep, keep coming back in these stories. But uh, James Wood Boulding, you can see the census tells us he had seven enslaved persons in 1820 and then rose to 24 and 37 over the next two years. And potentially John Boulding was among them in the 1830 count and even the 1840 count uh, before he escaped to. Uh, Kipsey, and then was captured by marshals because of the uh, uh, federal laws at the time. And then we'll just end with a story about a family I've more recently come to know. I got a call from a woman in Australia and then in New Zealand looking for information about their ancestors. And Alfred and Alonzo Brown were brothers. Alfred in the 1840s went to Australia. He's the one who went with Coffin Captain. Uh, Alonzo Brown stayed in Poughkeepsie and he lived at 32 North uh, Clinton or North Hamilton Street uh, there. And the mother, Judith Brown, she would have been in the audience with Alonzo Brown. Um, she was born in 1796. And as I say, she saw one son go to Australia and one stay in Poughkeepsie, but I imagine they would have been in the audience. And as we leave College Hill, and into the 20th century, I just want to end with a couple of nods to uh, the 20th century, including Jane Boland's birthplace. And it was the extraordinary research work of uh, Holly Wahlberg that was able to figure out which house she was born in, because there was a crazy change of numbers for several, in several different instances. But she was able to determine that this house right at the entrance if you were going to the golf course, was where Jane Boland was born. Uh, the family was staying there while their new or bigger house on Grand Avenue was under construction. So we could give a nod to uh, Jane Boland's birthplace. The churches are incredibly important. And the AME Zion Church on Smith Street is on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, that was done by uh, Walter Patrice. And the woman shown here Sadie Peterson Delaney. She grew up in Poughkeepsie and went on to be a famous uh, bibliotherapist in Tuskegee Veterans Hospital for returning veterans from World War I. And if you go to the trail, you'll find a link to her story there. And 
just a nod to Mr. Patrice, who, who uh, worked on the nomination for the National Register. He was a first lieutenant uh, serving in World War II in Europe. And he told me once, because I live in the little town of Milan, the smallest town in Dutchess County, so not, I'm always glad when there's some connection to something. Uh, Mr. Patrice's grandfather, Jasper, on the left there, uh, owned a farm in Milan, but he said a lot of African Americans after the end of the Civil War, and the census bears this out, moved to cities like Poughkeepsie or New York City or elsewhere, and that decline in persons of color in rural Dutchess County never really got replenished. So a nod to our historian, <laughs> Mr. Patrice. While we're there, the earlier site of the AME Zion Church is on Catherine Street. That's where the, the parade and celebration would have started for Frederick Douglass. Um, and it's kind of a little artist rendition there. And then as we went our way back across the uh, walkway, maybe we stop in the middle again and reflect on, as we look down at the uh, railroad station, which has been there since the train started operating there in 1850. Uh, we can pause and look at that station and think about Abraham Lincoln. He, effect, he stopped at Poughkeepsie twice and they were perfect bookends to the Civil War although tragic ones. Uh, he in basically invented the whistle stop tour for his first inauguration. So in, uh, this, in early 1861, he left Springfield, Illinois on a long trip to Washington to take the oath of office. He left Albany February 19, 1861 and people gathered all along the train tracks, but he only stopped at a couple of places very briefly, uh, Rhinecliff, a beacon, and he stopped at Poughkeepsie for 15 minutes. And uh, he was a president who had won, but with only 39% of the popular vote. And when you look at what he said within 15 minutes at Poughkeepsie, which you'll, you can find at the trail, you'll see how profoundly he was aware that he was elected by a minority of the population and that he was speaking probably to a majority of people who didn't support him. And it's kind of revealing as to how he handled the whole, uh, the whole matter of how you heal uh, such a divided country. I'm going to, uh, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna wrap up by just invoking our sponsors and partners uh, with a suggestion that we invest where we want the future to be. And we have to thank the Dutchess County government for the sponsorship that allows us to bring this at no cost. As I said before, uh, we appreciate that. January, February, and March is the membership drive of the Dutchess County Historical Society. Don't be shy. Invest where you want the future to be, especially if you think the past is something that should be <laughs> in the future. Uh, we have a membership drive because we have a big membership meeting in April. And uh, also celebrating the African spirit as memberships and is worthy of support too. And the, of the many things that are done during the year, there's kind of a culminating event with this Frederick Douglass Day, which is now uh, set, uh, we, we try to avoid Sundays, it's set for July 29th. So I hope you'll keep your eye out uh, for that because we have some interesting um, engagement of Poughkeepsie youth in developing some programs and performance that express the principles and values of Frederick Douglass, but in a more, in a more contemporary way. So I think that with that, I will wrap up and take questions.